Jeremiah chapter number 18, if you'll turn there, Jeremiah chapter number 18, and uh, we're going to look at the potter and the clay, the potter and the clay. You, do you remember the potter that we had here not too long ago, a couple of, couple of years ago, wasn't it? Or was it last year? Was it last year? We had him here, and um, I called him this morning. I'm on, by the way. Um, Anyway, I called him this morning, and he's in South Florida, headed up to, I think he was headed up to Sebastian. Does anybody know where that, that is? I'm sure you know where that is. But anyway, he was headed up uh, that way, and he was going to be preaching this morning. But I told him, I said, uh, Brother David, I said, uh, I'm going to be preaching on the potter and the clay this morning. I thought about you when I read this passage of Scripture. He did an excellent job, didn't he? And uh Good, uh, good man of God and uh, excellent in pottery. He, he knows his stuff, been doing it for a long time. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Strange place to hear the word of God, isn't it? Potter's house. But God was always uh, giving the word of God in different and strange places. But he said, Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Father, would you put your blessing upon the word this morning in Jesus' name, amen. I would call this, if I, uh, the, the text that I want to use is in verse number, oh, let's see, verse, let's see, look at, oh yeah, verse number four, look at verse number four, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, and here, here's the text that I want to use this morning, so he made it again, so he made it again. <clears throat> How many of you ever had a second chance at something? I'm glad for we look. I'm glad we have a God of the second chance. My uh, my mom, my mom was the parent of the second chance. My daddy wasn't. <laughs> he told me one time he didn't give me a second chance. But mom would say, "I told you that if you did this," and I said, "Okay, mom, just okay." She said, "Now I'm not going to tell you anymore." And after the 15th time or something, then she finally did something about it. But I'm glad for the God of the second chance. Yes, sir. And uh, I, I thought about people in the Bible that were given a second chance. I'm not going to give them to, all to you. But you recall Cain. Very first. Li listen, think about this. He was the very first one that was given a second chance. He killed his brother, murdered his brother. God said, uh, God said to Cain, he said, Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Cain brought the wrong, Cain had the wrong heart, so thus he brought the wrong offering. But God gave him a second chance. God says, if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted. Well, he went on and killed his brother. Then I thought about, uh, I thought about Abraham. Abraham went down to Egypt when the famine came. He should have stayed where God wanted him to. And uh, the God that called him out of a heathen country, out of the earth, the Chaldees, was the same God that could have took care of him in the famine. But he had to go down to the world, to Egypt, type of the world, to, uh, to, to be sure he was going to be taken care of. But God gave him a second chance. He almost lost his wife down there. He, he told, uh, he told uh, Pharaoh down there, he said, that she's my sister. Now, we're not talking about West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. This was in... <laughs> Man. So anyway, God gave Abraham his chance. Look, God gave Lot another chance. You remember when those kings came in and invaded Sodom and Gomorrah and took, took everything out of there, got Lot and his family and took him. Abraham went and rescued him. You thought that maybe Lot would have stayed away from that place, but he went back down to Sodom and Gomorrah. God gave him a second chance, chance got him out of that place before he rained down fire up on that heathen uh, place. And then God gave Samson another chance. God gave David another chance. God gave, uh, how about Peter? Boy, did God give a second chance there. God gave Peter a second chance. 
And I probably am looking, and you are looking also back this way. I am probably looking at people that God has given a second chance. He did me. I don't know if he did you, but he gave me a second chance. And I thank God, not only a second chance, but third and fourth and fifth and sixth. God is a God of grace. Well, I want you to, I want, I want to deal with three things this morning. Number one, I want to deal with creation. I want to deal with desecration, number two. And I want to deal with recreation. So in verse number three, chapter 18, Jeremiah, I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. First of all, I, I want you to think about that potter. That potter has in his heart or in his mind what he wants to do with that clay. So there is a yearning in the heart of that potter. But I want you to think about that potter's wheel. I want you to think about that potter's wheel. I believe that potter's wheel represents time. David wrote, or the psalmist wrote in Psalm, I think it was Psalm 31, he says, my times are in thy hands. You know, um, God has, God has, if you're saved, God has you in his hands. And you're in the hands not only of God, but you're in the hands of Jesus. But I'm thinking about that potter's wheel, how it is a circle. And it starts here, and where does it end? It doesn't. It just keeps going round and round and round. Just like your wedding band, just like your ring. It's a, it's a circle. And I think that potter's wheel represents time. And I, I said that to say this, that it is never ending. Do you know <clears throat> the moment you were conceived, the moment you were conceived, you began a life of eternity. He said, now wait a minute, preacher. Yeah, listen, your body is going to die. But your spirit and your soul goes on and on and on and on. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is never ending just like that wheel. And when the Bible says that we come into this world, we come into this world and it is certain that we're going to what? Carry nothing out. Now this physical is going to begin and it's going to end somewhere. But I promise you that soul and that spirit is everlasting, never ending. The Bible says unto dust thou art. And what, what's the rest of that? And unto dust thou shalt return. It makes a full circle, doesn't it? Just comes back. At birth, listen, at birth, we are dependent. And as we grow older and older and older and get to that time, which physically we're going to leave this old world, guess what? We become dependent. You ever have somebody in their 20s and 30s say, I don't need nothing. You know, a phrase that you hear a lot of people say now is this. I got this. Well, say that when you're about 90 years old, 95. I, oh, yeah, I got this. I got a, a daughter sitting on the front row. I got a daughter that, Dad, are you taking this? Are you taking these pills? Are you taking that? Are you taking that? She wants to make sure I'm going to last forever. <laughs> but, but I'm not, I mean, she's in the vitamin business. But anyway, but I'm just telling you, that you come into this world with nothing, and it's certain you're going to carry nothing out. You come into this world fat and bald headed, and that's the way you're going to leave. Amen. That's good preaching. Right? That's good preaching. So, amen. I, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. We're talking about creation here. We're talking about creation. And so we think about that potter's wheel represents time. But we think about the potter's workmanship. Workmanship. He has, he knows what he's wanting to do in his heart and in his mind. In fact, Ephesians 2, you know what Ephesians 2 says in verse number 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. Now, I just quoted that, but I want you to turn there and look at it very carefully. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. 
By grace you save through faith and so forth. But in verse number 10, again it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus just to go to heaven. No. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You remember that fad they used to have? Maybe it was in the 70s. Um, everybody, they, they, they were pushing or they were promoting um, rocks, pet rocks. You remember that? Pet rocks. What a useless thing. <laughs> pet rocks. And, and people was actually, look, people was buying that stuff. What, did they give them a name? Or you could give them a name. Did it have a certificate of birth? <laughs> Of creation or whatever. Wasn't that kind of dumb? Now that you think about it, what a fad. You know, a lot of fads are kind of dumb, aren't they? I think I'll start wearing bell bottoms again. I don't know, platform <laughs> shoes. And, but in, in, anyway, I, I said all that to say this. Jesus said that if you're saved, number one, you're saved by grace. Number two, you're saved through faith. And number three, you are his workmanship. Now, you will never be anything apart from his grace. You will never be anything apart from his grace. And so a believer, listen to me, a believer is always in the hands of God. He is always in the hands of the divine potter. What if, for those who believe you can lose your salvation... What if God would take his hands off? What if our divine potter would take his hands off of the clay? What do you think would happen? Well, a couple of different things. It just lay there like a lump. But if that wheel spinning fast enough, phew, that piece, that, that wad of clay, that lump of clay is going to fall off that wheel. But if you're saved, you're in the hands of the divine potter. And he wants to mold you and make you and shape you into what he wants, not what we want. All right? So we're always in the hands of the divine potter, our heavenly potter. Let's look at the second thing here. There's not only a yearning in the heart of that potter. He knows what he wants to do. But there has to be a yielding in the hands of the potter. You see, it is... It is water, by the way, it is water that makes the clay pliable, right? He, if you noticed our potter when he came up here, he had a little, he had a sponge and he had a little bowl of water and he would take that sponge and put it in the water and he would just squeeze that sponge out over the clay as it was turning. Now, water in the Bible can mean two things. Number one, if it's water that's in a container, water contained is a type of the word of God. Brother Bill talked about that this morning in Sunday school. Water contained is a type of the word of God. But water that is moving or flowing is a type of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if you want God to mold you and make you, he's going to have to use the word of God and the Holy Spirit to make you and mold you what you need to be. And without that, you're not going to be what God wants you to be. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Your body is the what? Temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. But he's not going to make you read his word. He's not going to answer some magic prayer and say, oh, God, just help me to know scripture like Brother Bill does. That's not going to happen unless you get into the Word of God and study and meditate in the Scriptures. And this book, it's already been said this morning, I'm repeating this, but this book will make you what you ought to be in the hands of the divine potter. But unlike the potter, we have a free will. And we exercise that free will all the time. And God will not make you do something if you don't want to do it. Well, listen, I know the argument. He's sovereign and he's all, he, he can do anything. I know that. But number one, he's not going to save you if you don't want to get saved. 
And number two, he's not going to make you go to church if you don't want to go to church. Look, he's not going to, he's not going to, there's not going to hand, come a hand out of the sky and jerk you out of the bed and slap you around a little bit. Wake up, wake up, let's go. He's not going to do that. And he's not going to make you read the Bible. And he's not going to make you pray. And he's not going to make you witness. See, unlike the clay, we have a free will. And by the way, all of us here, we do what we want to do. It's, I kind of joke about this, about Baptist folks. I said, no need to tell Baptist folk anything. They're going to do what they want to do. <laughs> Amen. Well, there has to be a yielding in the hands of that potter. Well, look at verse number four, Jeremiah 18. Look at verse number four. We see verse three. Here's the creation. He, he wrought a work on the wheel. But verse number four. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. There's a, there's a desecration. Something happened. By the way, did you notice that that marred vessel was still in the hands of the potter? That's, that right there is eternal security. And by the way, he doesn't throw this thing away either, does he? So that which marred that vessel, listen to me, that which made that vessel unworthy to be used was found inside of that clay. Not on the outside. It was found on the inside. As he would pour the water on the clay and, make, and mold it and shape it and everything, his fingers would eventually feel that which does not belong in there. Maybe a piece of stone, maybe a, a thread, maybe a, a piece of straw or something, a piece of dirt. But that started out on the inside. That is what marred the clay. It eventually worked itself on the outside. By the way, that's the way sin starts. Sin works on the inside first. The Bible says, for out of the heart of man perceiveth forth adulteries, fornications, murders, backbiters, deceitfulness, and so forth. We can go on and on and on with that. But that starts on the inside. And Jesus said, that which defileth the man doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But can I say this? That when it starts on the inside, it will come out on the outside. It will come to surface. I preached a message long years ago. And, the, and, I, and I remember the title. I don't remember the message, but I remember the title. And I entitled the message, The Real You will come out. It did for Judas Iscariot. Look, he was one of the Lord's chosen disciples. Jesus knew what he was doing when he chose him. He knew that he was a devil, but the other 11 disciples had no idea that Judas was what, was what he was. Inside of Judas was the devil working in his heart and working in his mind. When Jesus said at, at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, one of you this night shall betray me, Judas knew who it was, and Jesus knew who it was, but 11 disciples had no idea. They began to ask the question, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? The real you will come out. You see, I think all over our land, all over our churches, our people who are pretenders, they look pretty good on the outside. But inside of them is working something that's going to ruin them maybe for the rest of their life. It will eventually come out to the surface. It will eventually mar them. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, or God's talking about here. But we, unlike that clay, have a free will. And we cannot and will not let God have his way if 
we don't want to. Are you listening? Our pride and our disobedience will stop the work on the wheel. And we will be marred and made useless and put up on a shelf. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 that Paul was talking about. You know what he said? He said, I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection. That by any means where I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Not lost, not going to hell, but to be unused. And so when I think of that word marred, the word marred means to bow down. It means to incline or it means to humble. That vessel was marred. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something. God sure knows how to humble us, doesn't he? He really does. Can I just say it this way? God, sometimes he knows, well, sometimes, all the time, God knows how to downright embarrass us. Well, look at Peter. Standing outside, watching Jesus on trial, watching Jesus go through this. And that little maid says, I've seen you somewhere. <laughs> Aren't you one of his disciples? And he said, no. Jesus got through telling him a few hours before when Peter said, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you all the way. Jesus talk, talked about him being crucified and all that. No, no, I'm not going to let that happen, Lord. I'll follow you. I'll take care of it. I'll defend you. Jesus said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. That little lady, that little maid, she said, aren't you, don't you belong to him? Aren't you one of his disciples? I don't know. Second time happened, third time happened, after the third time, that old rooster throwed its chest out, and its head back, and cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> By the way, I've been raised around chickens, and I've been around chickens. They don't sound a thing like cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> they don't say that. Do they? Do they, Tom? They don't say that, do they? But I'm going to tell you what, it got Peter's attention, and it had, listen, it had to embarrass him. But thank God the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. The second chance, right? Second chance. Not only a desecration, the clay is still in his hands, but the cause, listen to me, the cause is still in our flesh. You see, when you get saved, God didn't do a thing for your flesh. Right? Flesh is flesh. Jesus told Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Let's run a few scriptures. Romans, and we'll take them in order. I got three of them I want you to look at. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. The Lord knows how to humble us. But the clay is still in his hands, but the cause is still in our flesh. In Romans 7, verse number 24. Look at verse 24. Look what Paul says. Greatest preacher other than Christ. The greatest preacher, the greatest apostle that Jesus ever had. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, this body's killing me. This body is nothing but flesh, and it's making me wretched. O wretched man that I am. Well, you know that to be true when you've gotten on your knees and praying to God, or when you open up the scriptures and you're reading and meditating upon the word of God and such a wicked thought will come through your mind at the very holiest moment that you feel. That's the flesh. I'm telling you, that's the flesh. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Talking about the flesh. Wicked, isn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 27. I, I quoted this just a minute ago. All right, it says, <clears throat> but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 
You know, many of God's people have been put up on that shelf. You know what's embarrassing? You know what's not uh, embarrassing is the wrong word. You know what is what brings a reproach to Jesus is when some Christian has been living for the Lord, got caught up in sin, let the flesh take control, and he or she is no longer in the house of God. I've met people, look, I've knocked on doors and met people, and I said, are you saved, sir? He said, yeah, I'm saved. He said, I used to be a deacon in a church. I said, well, how long have you been out of church? I haven't been to church in 25 years. And my thinking is, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. I, I'm just telling you, if you're not careful, you can be desecrated on the wheel of God by your own will. Well, not only desecrate, well, one more. Galatians, look at Galatians. We're headed that way. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. Galatians 5, 16. All right, look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now you can't do both at the same time. You're either doing one or the other. But he said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Can I just tell you this flesh is pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Look, when you, <clears throat> when you meet some guy coming up, when some guy comes up to you and he's staggered or he's higher than a kite and, and you try to tell him about Jesus, he says, oh man, I'm just having a good time. You're wasting your time until he sobers up. He, he is having a good time. He's not caring about what you say about heaven, about the Bible. You can threaten him with hell or anything like that, but he's not going to pay any attention to that. He's having a good time. But you get him while he's sober. And you let the Holy Spirit of God convict his heart. And he'll change his tune. Well, many of God's people have been put up on that shelf. Let me give you the last thing. Go back to Jeremiah. We have creation. Roddy's work on a wheel. We have desecration marred in the hands of the potter. But in verse number four, Verse number four, we read that. But look what he says. Yeah, verse four. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. There's the desecration in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. It didn't say he made the same one. It said he made another vessel, right? So there is recreation. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit does not waste his time patching up things. The Holy Spirit collects the fragments, he picks up the cracked and the marred vessels, and he puts them in the hands of the omnipotent love, that heavenly potter, to make something perfect and lovely, which will bring praise and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's three things I'm going to give you when we, as we close. There's three things that I'll give you that will bring you back to recreation. Number one, there is the great passion of God for your soul. Look, the love that went to Calvary, that shed his blood for you, that paid for your sin, is the same everlasting love that will never let you go. Why did he take that, potter, that, that pottery, those broken pieces, and make it again another vessel because of his great love. God has taken many a life that has been messed up or that messed up. Once you had served God with all your heart, something came in your life, something happened. It's usually another person, by the way. Made your life a mess, and now you think, I have no hope. Look, that same love, that same Jesus that loves you and went to Calvary is the same one that wants to put your wretched, broken life back together again. Same one. He loves you that much. Now, we got religion that don't, that don't want to do that. Religion don't want to touch that. But the love of Calvary will. I promise you that. That love that went to Calvary is an everlasting love. 
Now I'm going to show you something, and you may not see the connection right now, but you will in just a second. Go to Matthew chapter number 27. Hold your place here in Jeremiah. Let's go to Matthew 27, and you'll see the connection here. Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew 27. Look at verse number 3. Verse number 3. Then Judas, are you there? All right. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Now, remember what he did, right? He sold Jesus out. He sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Now, verse 4. Saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of what church? Blood. Price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field. You see in the connection here? Let's read on. They bought the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field is called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued. I, wanna, I, want, I wonder how valuable is Jesus to you? And he says, of whom of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Now, the potter's field, we're dealing with the potter, right? The potter's field was bought with the price of blood. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus has purchased every broken vessel in this place today. Whether you're saved, it's not whether you're saved, if you're saved and you're serving God, or if you're saved and you're backslidden and you've been marred and you're broken and you're just falling to pieces, I'm telling you, the precious blood of Jesus Christ purchased you. But then there's the last thing I want you to see back over in Jeremiah. I thought about the process of recreation. Well, what goes on? Does the potter get rid of the wheel? Does he get rid of, does he let somebody else do it? Or does he do it himself? Well, there's two things got to happen. First of all, the clay must be softened and crushed. There's got to be a brokenness. Jesus just doesn't patch up things. There has to be a brokenness. I'm telling you, pride has no Pride has nothing to do with salvation or a backslider coming back to make things right with God. Man, I'm telling you, if you're not broken, you're not ready to be put back together. And you know how God breaks your heart? He'll usually break it through circumstances and things of that nature, but he'll certainly break it with the word of God. It's called conviction. And God delivered me from any church that when a preacher gets up, you never have any conviction whatsoever. There's churches out there like that. Man, they're afraid to say anything about sin because you won't put your $2 in the offering plate. <laughs> they're afraid that they might offend people. I'm going to tell you, we're just going to preach, thus saith the Lord. And let God take care of that. God will. But then, number one, that clay must be softened and crushed. By the way, he uses that, he uses that water again to soften that clay. Do you know that? And then, number two, the divine potter has to have 
a free hand. I mean, there, there cannot be any resistance. Either he has a free hand or he cannot mold you and make you and shape you into what you need to be. And here's what he does when he makes it again. He, he made it again, the Bible says, another vessel has seemed good to the potter to make it. To build up, he wants to build up something that will take the place of that which has been shattered. I'm glad that God could use Peter again. Aren't you? And he did use him. You think about what took place on the day of Pentecost. God greatly used him. I'm glad God could still use people. Some preachers don't want to use them, but God can. Right? Man, I know some, I know some preachers that if you messed up in your life, you're not even allowed to sing in a choir. I know some preachers that if you messed up in your life and you got all kinds of tattoos and everything, and oh, no, we don't want you being any part of anything. You just sit back there and behave yourself. I'm just going to tell you this. I'm glad that God can still use people that have been broken right. and busted up yes. and messed, listen, and messed up and put them back in the work of God again. He can and he will. But we've got to be pliable. And we've got to say, Lord, here I am. I messed up. Look, folks, I don't give my testimony around here. I'll just say this. I'll just say this. There was a time I messed up in my life. I didn't kill anybody. Didn't murder anybody. Wanted to, but... But I remember I rededicated my life at a little Baptist church that I was saved in. Up on a hill, Red Star Missionary Baptist Church. And I rededicated my life and I said, Lord, I'm through with that kind of life I've been living. I'm not going to live that way anymore. I repented, Cliff. I turned to God. I turned away from all that mess and turned to God. And thank God. He's kept me going. Went back to those places and said, fellas, I'm not going to do what you used to do and what we used to do together. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go here. I'm not going to drink that. And I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do all. I'm not going to do any of that. I said, I'm not belittling you, but I tell you, I found something better that I left a long time ago. I said, you can come go along with me if you want. I told I know I'm getting old, so I, I repeat myself. <laughs> so one old boy, I, and I walked away. I, I I felt defeated when I went to that crowd. By the way, it was on a soul winning night, and I had my Bible in my hand, and I thought, who is the be who would be the best bunch of people to go soul winning to, other than that group I used to belong to? Man, I went right in the middle of them. Carried my Bible, had a suit on, walked over to fellas. They said, Blockston? <laughs> they said, did somebody die? I said, yeah, I did. I said, the old me died. I said, I want to tell you, fellas, I love you, and I want you to go to heaven with me. But I'm, I can't run the way you run. I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I said, I'm not any better than you. I said, I'm just not going to do it. And they started laughing. I felt so defeated. And I turned around and I walked off. And one old boy said, hey, Jerry, hold up a minute. I said, what do you want, Randy? He said, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to do any things that, you, that you're doing now. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. I can't be a part of that. He said, but I admire you for telling us, and I thank you for it. Probably three or four of those boys either died of drunkard's death, overdose, or got murdered. I hope they got, <clears throat> I hope they trusted Christ before any of that stuff happened, but I doubt it. 
And I'm just telling you, I, you're looking at somebody that was broken and marred, and God got a hold of me and put me back together again. Lord, amen. And it can be done. Amen. I'm, not setting, I'm not standing up here as an example. I'm just telling you how great God is. But I had to be willing to do it. Are you willing to be used? Are you willing to just let God have a free hand in your life? And he will if you'll let him. He will. Father, I love you. And I want to thank you for not throwing me away when I deserve to be thrown away. And I just pray that there's someone that feels that way here this morning. Feels that God is against them. God has thrown them away. He hasn't. He loves them. The same love that he showed at Calvary is the same love that he shows now. Father, would you take that broken life this morning and make it again another vessel as you see fit. And if there's one here that needs to be saved, Lord, would you please save them? We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Love.